Hi friends, I'm Lauren Burnick, and I'm flipping the script about growing older. My guests have been influencers since before that was even a thing. Welcome to the Anti-Anti-Aging Podcast. Welcome to Age Like a Badass Mother. Trish Murphy is a rock star. To see her boundless energy on stage is to witness someone squeezing the juice out of life. You would never believe that she's 60. She exudes the vitality of someone half her age. That's because she knows stuff, stuff she's going to share with us today. Since moving to Austin, Texas from Houston in 1996, Trish Murphy has had a long musical journey. She first became known as a singer-songwriter when her first solo album, Crooked Mile, was picked up by local radio stations. Three more albums followed, supported by endless touring throughout the southeastern U.S. and Europe, including stints on the Lilith Fair tour. Her busy life has included plenty of side hustle, radio, TV, commercial work, teaching cooking classes at Central Market, and a great gig as the female singer of the mega hits supergroup Skyrocket have kept her young and helped her to learn to age like a badass mother. Please welcome our guest today, Trish Murphy. Lauren, Hello. thank you so hi. Thank you so much for having me. This is such a thrill. <laughs> this such is a thrill. fun. Yeah. Um, yeah. so if anyone grew up in Houston, Austin, I don't know. Did you guys play San Antonio and Dallas back in the day? We did, yeah. especially especially Dallas, yeah. Especially so if, if anybody grew up and Gen Xers, you guys probably know Trish and her brother Darren, Trish and Darren Murphy. Um I used to see them all the time in Houston when I was growing up at oh, I'd see you mostly at Satellite Lounge playing. Yeah. You guys yeah. are so good and now you're I, I guess it's a new, how long have you been playing in Skyrocket? This is, believe it or not, probably year 15 for us. It, it oh, started, wow. it had, yeah, it had sort of a slow build, um, in the early two thousands, but then it kind of, it kind of exploded around 2008, 2010. And, uh, and it's, you know, the phone's still ringing. It's crazy. It's so good. It's it's covers from what? Do you have like a period that you do covers from? We kind of call it the vinyl era, which okay. uh, for people that grew up listening to records, they they kind of that's kind of the the anchor for it. But it's it's primarily six, 70s and 80s. Um and then whatever else that we want to throw in that we feel we can represent well. So yeah. I mean, you guys are so it is such a fun um, show to see, like you, you know, every single song you're dancing around. It's so, it's a great, but you know, you've had a, a long illustrious career as a singer songwriter, as you said, how did you stay healthy on the road? Like when you were, you know, touring around? Well, initially in the early days, I had a, I had a band that I was touring with and, and, a, and a manager. And so as the person who was going to be kind of carrying the load of the show each night, it was a real priority to get plenty of sleep, um, to stay really hydrated and to try to eat well. And so I made those three things my mission. One of the things I discovered that's kind of cool about um, the, the United States is that in most cities where I was touring, uh, kind of east of the Pecos River, so this is mostly in the in the southeast and Midwest. Every town has a has a river running through it. Almost every city was planned. Oh, really? On a on some sort of a of a, a water trade route. So yeah, I guess that makes yeah. sense. So now there's jogging trails around the rivers, and so almost every town had a path where I could jog or walk in the afternoon before a show, so that I could kind of get some fitness in. Um, and then I made it kind of my own mission to you know, kind of sleuth ahead and find places to eat. Even if it was just a mom and pop place, even if it was a greasy spoon diner, if it was made on site, that was so much better than going to a sort of a more commercial corporate replicable place to eat, mm -hmm. to eat. Cause you're going to get yeah. locally, you're going to fresh produce. They have great great suppliers in these, you know, cities. And so that kind of made me feel good about how I was taking care of myself. Oh, that's yeah. pretty good for a rock star. I'm going to say, uh, that's, <laughs> I don't think, 
Well, you were like drinking your ass off and trashing your hotel room. No, no, no. But you know, I did have a routine though. I mean, I had a little decadent, a little routine of decadence. So each evening, you know, about an hour before it was time to go on, I would sequester myself in the dressing room or, or the, you know, wherever I was. And I would get my makeup out and f- figure out what I, what I was going to wear. And then I would pour myself a drink. And so I would have usually Canadian whiskey, Irish whiskey, and I'd have it neat. And it would take me 45 minutes to drink it. But by the time I had had my whiskey and had my makeup and had my clothes on, I was centered, ready. You were ready. (laughs) That was my... (laughs) Okay, that's what I wanted to hear. Something... No. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) It's it's balance. (laughs) I think one of these days I'm going to write, uh, we were talking about writing books. You and I had a conversation before this where you're, you were going to be working on a book and I, 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 I sometimes will fantasize about book titles. And I think one book that I would like to write, I don't know what it would be about, but the title would be first you pour yourself a drink. (laughs) I had a mother-in-law who used to say that to me. She taught me how to fry chicken and she said, First, you pour yourself a drink. Oh my God, that's and, hilarious! And then the fried chicken instructions flowed out from there. Followed, so, yeah. That's you know that is a very um, southern thing. I remember being in the grocery store when I was like a young mom, and I heard these two older ladies behind me talking, and the one's like, "I just am not a good cook," and the other one goes, "Oh, honey, that's because you don't drink enough." <laughs> like uh only in texas <laughs> yeah yes yeah. it was hilarious did you finish telling us all the stuff that helps you stay ahead of the curve was that mainly it uh the just staying on top of your diet and your exercise or were there other things we kind of got off topic i don't know what happened but uh, oh yeah staying ahead of the curve for, yeah so another curve thing that that happened for me in in my 40s was the realization that I was in this beautiful midway spot between my girlfriends who were in their 20s and my girlfriends who were in their 60s. And I actually had that that female tribe. Um, I had a young intern who worked for me when I was doing all my own record promotion and mail outs and you name it. I was, you know, grinding the wheat and you know, baking the bread myself. So I had an intern and she was super smart and kept me on my toes. And then, um, through a girls organization that I volunteered for, for called Jen Austin, they're still in existence, but I was heavily involved with them throughout most of my forties. And, um, the board members were in all sorts of stages of life. And I adopted a mentor she was in her mid fifties when we met. She is now in her mid seventies and still my Yoda in my life. She's still my mentor, um, 15, maybe 20 years older than me and talk about living her best life. She's such an inspiration and she's a badass. I mean, she's, she's not just this person that makes all these great decisions. She's got a wild streak and she's got a creative streak and she's got a rebellious streak. And I think women, that's part of a well-rounded womanhood is to, Mm -hmm. is to, to stay wild. Oh yeah. Is that your um, yoga teacher that you were telling me about? This woman, this woman, her name's Donna, actually her name's Donna Van Fleet. And she was retired from IBM. She was one of the seven female executives at IBM and that were in management positions at that time. And she, she had planned on retiring early. So she retired at 50 ish. Um, and by the time I met her, she was on a bunch of boards and she's a a very mathematical, creative thinker. So she had a lot of skill sets that I didn't feel were my strong suit. And she also saw things from a, from, from more elevation than I could see them. And so she became a person who could tell me what was coming. She could tell mm-hmm. me what was around the corner and she could show me where my blind spots were. Um, yeah. Whether or not I could do anything about them, just it was comforting to know that somebody had my back. Yeah. I want to keep talking about, you know, the women of the different age, but I, before we get too far from it, what do, what do you mean by women need to stay wild? What do you mean? 
Well, I think that the closest I can get to the truth about it is this. We have many of us, some of us are lucky not to have this, but I include myself in this category. We have a tendency to second guess ourselves. We have a tendency to over weigh our self-doubt. We have a tendency to uh, overthink things. Mm. And it's also easy when you get pushback, it's easy for me to just concede, probably because I, I don't, I'm not comfortable with conflict. But even more, what I've discovered is that I'm not uncomfortable being disagreeable. And, and that doesn't mean that I have to be ugly or rude or, or bitchy or any of that stuff. It's just the matter of fact strength to quietly say with a shrug, you know, I see it differently. And yeah. no, no, I'm not going to give ground. I'm not. And so I think that that's yeah. the piece that requires a little bit of, of a little bit of, of swagger, a little so, bit of attitude. Yeah. 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 It's kind of like just staying true to yourself and, and speaking up for yourself. Yes. Because yeah. I, you know what, that's one thing that I keep hearing from the women that I'm interviewing who have had like a nice, big, beautiful life that I think are doing it well is that they're not afraid. Like you said, you don't have to be ugly, but you know, just to say like, that's, that's, I'm not comfortable with that. Or I don't see it that way. Just like you said, and just stand up for yourself. And I, you know, cause when you were saying be wild, I was like, what do you mean? Are you like swinging from the chandeliers or, but no, you just mean like staying Staying true to your nature, staying true to yourself. Yeah. And there is a, there is a, um, it, it has an erotic quality. And by that, I don't mean it in the sexual sense. I mean it in, in having a connectedness to, to the fire in your belly. That's the yes. wild bit. And, you know, I play guitar for a living and, you know, you can, you can, you know, swagger around with a guitar and you can fake it for a long time. And it, it so from the outside, it might seem that I had a strong possession of that. But what I've discovered through my life experience is that I didn't have a handle on it. And in, in my career as a, a girl swinging a guitar, part of the struggle for me was recognizing that I was not integrated or reintegrated. I think it's it was severed in me maybe as a girl, but I hadn't reintegrated it. And so I want to say this clearly for, for women listening, that, that that could be a lifelong process. And we may have jobs where we have to really look like we've got it all together, but on the inside, we may not be integrated yet. And I want to uh, put that out there because I think that it's, it's something that needs to be stated so that we are aware of it because otherwise you just feel confused. You feel a little foggy or you feel, you feel all this, uh, you feel all this, um, um, com inner conflict. And I think when you can yeah. state, when you can state the issue, you can get clear on it. And you, that's a, that's a step in a good direction. Is that what you mean by integrated? Like being able to identify what you feel comfortable with and or what do you mean by integrated? Well, certainly boundaries are a part of it, but I think to be, what I mean by being integrated is being thoroughly connected with that part of yourself that, that knows that even when you feel like you're in doubt, your gut feeling is telling you something. Mm -hmm. So the ability okay. to, to, to stay connected to knowing what you know and that's, that's also the part of us that will, won't equivocate. It's the part of us that keeps ourselves safe. We provide our safety that way. And as women, that's really important to be able to do. When you need to be unequivocal with somebody who is making you uncomfortable, who's maybe exhibiting some predatory behavior, who's posing a threat, that's when those certitude voices come in. And animals don't equivocate. Dogs yeah. growl and bark You're and right. women need to be able to growl and bark in an unequivocal way. And that's what I mean by staying wild. It is also about yes. staying safe. 
Okay, and I'm getting this now. I'm yeah. getting it's all coming together for me. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of what you were talking about before, your intuition, you know, that mm-hmm. things are always giving you clues and I think that you're right. Like we we've been that's been kind of trained out of us. We'll just be nice. Don't make people uncomfortable. Yeah. And, but well, yeah, no, you have to listen to yourself and you have to, you know, I'm, I cannot imagine the misogyny that you faced, like being a, a musician. And I mean, it was probably incredible. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Lauren here. Are you struggling with menopausal weight gain, inflammation, autoimmune symptoms, or gastrointestinal issues? If so, go to wellelephant.com and find out how I can help you with my ACE plant-based eating course. It's fast, effective, and proven. Go to wellelephant.com and use discount code ACE40. Well, you... you you read a lot of stories from other artists. You know, I was diving into memoirs from other female musicians and hearing their stories. And um, in general, I w- I'll say that I felt fortunate that that in the end, I think that the experiences that were respectful and congenial and fun and that transcended gender. I think I had more of those than I did of the yucky experiences. Yeah. And and a lot That's of good. the Yeah, a lot of the a lot of the yucky experiences had less to do with with you know any any sort of creepy opportunistic things. They're sure that's 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 always kind of there looming in the in the distance, but it was really more about the state of the industry at the time, even though the nineties were a time when women in music was the flavor of the day. So there were, maybe there was more of a prevalence of female artists in the soundscape on the radio. They had their kind of moment, um, Sarah McLaughlin and Cheryl Mm -hmm. Crow and, and um, all the different female solo artists that, that, that appeared kind of in our, in our, you know, MTV experience, there still were certain rules that were unwritten and nobody knew about them, but they were certainly written in stone in the industry. And Sarah McLaughlin really took a lot of that on when she did the music, the the music festivals over the summer called the Lilith Fair. The yes. whole, the whole point of, of those festivals was as a loud and vociferous protest against the statements that women couldn't be played on the radio as in, in as big of a, of a volume as men could. There were lots, endless spots for men on the radio, but only so many for women on any given radio format. And that was true. Um, And I had radio stations, I had women at radio stations tell me that flat out on the phone, Hey, we love your record. We're not going to play it. (laughs) Because we're playing, we so already have right a now. woman. Right. We already play a woman on the radio right. station. Yeah, That's record insanity. labels too. They'd say, uh, "We g- welcome. We're glad you signed to our record label, but we're not going to help you. We're already helping this person, and we only have room for one. So good luck." Wow. Uh, verbatim. That's what oh, we would I tell believe you. you 100%. So you know, it, it's and, and I don't, um, I, I don't. Looking back on it. I think this is one way that we can metabolize things is that we can sort of understand that everybody in life is functioning in a role and according to certain rules that they didn't make. So they're just following the rules. And that's the way that most of us experience life. And so in the end, it, it had less to do with me or my talent or how I measured up to other artists and really just more about the way things were at the time. And, um, yeah, Yeah. I mean, definitely like I, it just makes me think of, um, I don't know why it's making me think of this, I guess, just like a man run world, but, uh, Lately, I've been seeing this commercial for Tab Cola going around, and it's like, be slim for your man. He wants you to look great. And I'm like, what? This is from like the 70s. And that's all we drank at our house was Tab Cola. I mean, I don't think we drank water at our house. But uh, 
they, I mean, can you imagine having that on TV today? I mean, so at least we've come a little bit. I mean, you know, it, I mean, when I think about things like that, our generation's just been so, and all the generations before us, you know, and maybe even my daughter's generation, like the millennials, I think they started kind of unraveling this, but uh, what, like, what do you think, um, how do we reframe all that programming? Like for younger, for younger people, yeah, just younger how do we re and even for us, like, how do we reframe everything so that it's that things are like working out for our benefit or we're not telling ourselves these crazy stories anymore that we have to look this way or we have to be this way. You know, well, I think yeah. you're so good at that. Well, you know, it, it occurs to me <clears throat> what you just said about the tab commercials. It was a kind of a form of social slavery for mm -hmm. women. It was a message that we were, that we were, kind of was forced on us. And it was not forced on us so much, but it was just an expression of what advertisers assumed we were already thinking or already telling each other as women. And so there is a sense of gaining awareness about kind of the, the, the conversation about the conversation is what they used to say. Right. If you, yeah, if, and, yeah, yeah. and so for every form of social slavery that we, that we break out of a, a new one sort of comes along to supplant it. And I think we've probably seen this a lot with social media where there's this assumption now that you owe people your time and attention on social media. You've got mm -hmm. to give them likes and they've got to give you likes and talk about a forum for torturing ourselves by comparing ourselves to others. Yeah. Well, I want to go back to, we were, we started talking about, um, you know, having women like a little tribe that you had some older friends and some younger friends. I don't think we fully finished talking about that. What, why do you think it's important to have women on both sides of you? One of the things that I've been lucky enough to talk to some of my older women friends about, women who are in their 80s and 90s now, is what happens in life when you begin to lose your friends, when they begin to pass away and you're still standing. Mm. They talk about how profoundly it can affect your, your, your social health in later in life. And so to me, the cornerstone of having younger friends is that it sets you up for success when your older friends begin to leave you and when your family members pass away. And when then the people that are your age start to pass away, if you have invested in friendships with younger people, you then become their cornerstone mentors. You change roles and and talk about social health. It gives you a purpose. You go from being the beneficiary of those things to being the benefactor. And that gives you a purpose. Um, and believe me when I say those younger people, they'll value you more than ever because you become their older friend. And I think that when someone is looking to you saying, please help me, please you've modeled for me this thing that I didn't know how to do. You, you can, you can parent anyone. You can be anyone's mother, grandmother, sister, aunt, Jedi master, Yoda, <laughs> Yoda counts. Uh, but I just think that those are the roles, the identities that we must have had when we were more tribal as a people. Yes. You know? mm -hmm. Uh, Lauren, yeah, would, I mean, that's yeah. why they call it a tribe, right? I right, mean, right. But, but yeah, we don't live like that anymore. We so don't. We have to yeah. really. We have to outsource it. We have to, we have to, <laughs> we have to do the chosen family thing and we have to find younger people uh, and we have to, you know, make them give us a place in their lives. <laughs> I don't think anybody's going to give you any pushback. They're going to be thrilled to. <laughs> Thrilled to have you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I know. I'm kind of lucky with my um, daughter. I've become friends with a lot of her friends. I have like a little built-in thing there. I don't think my daughter loves it that much, but I've kind of nudged my way in there a little. Um, and so you have to. It's yeah. been great. Um, I know she, especially she has uh, her boss, and her boss 
started texting me one day and we were just cracking each other up. And my daughter's like, I do not like this. Stop it. (laughs) And, you know, my daughter's really (laughs) closed mouth about what her work. I mean, she's a therapist, so obviously she's not going to tell me, uh, you know, about the patients, but she just doesn't tell me anything. And uh, so then I'll be like, well, I'll just ask Rachel. And she's like, I do not like this. (laughs) So, uh, so, you know, but once in a while she'll have, you know, me and Rachel and uh, Rachel's wife over and some other friends and we like watch movies and we, uh, it's like, I just love hanging out with them. They're so awesome. And it is nice to have younger friends. And we've had this arc, right? You know, where um, throughout the sixties and seventies, it was such a, a youth culture a hundred percent and the the generation gap and the uh the you can't be hip if you're over 30 all the different yeah. social messages oh, from mid-century and what we're rediscovering now i think and i'm it's embarrassing to be rediscovering it because it's wisdom it's a proverb right that that with age comes wisdom and that yeah. um that people who live in extended families are like my big my big fat italian immigrant family you know where we were we were, we were generational and we were broad. My, you know, we had loads and loads of, of cousins to the second and third degree. And you didn't even know how you were kin to them, but you knew they were your cousins. So you had all these people and we tended to live in proximity to one another. And so we had the benefit of this large melting pot of of connections and relationships that, Mm -hmm. that it didn't matter what age people were, we were connected. And I've seen this going back to Italy, which is one of my favorite places on earth to visit. And one of the delights that, that I see when I go there is you can be in a restaurant and you can see a 24 year old kid sitting at the table talking to the, the 78 year old restaurant proprietor, and they are speaking as equals They're not speaking. Mm -hmm. You don't see that weird kind of roguish, I'm the young hot dude and you're the old, you're the old fuddy duddy. There's, there's, there's a lot of effortless respect between them. And that's a friendship. That's what, that's what friendship looks like. And so you did grow up with a lot of your Italian family around you? We did. We grew up in Houston. And even though my dad was an only child and his last name was Murphy, he actually, um, (laughs) his mother was part of an enormous Italian clan. Um, she had, she had nine brothers and sisters and her parents had immigrated from, from, um, the east or northeastern part of Italy, not far from Bologna and a city called uh, Pesaro. And so they came and did the whole immigrant experience, Ellis Island to Chicago, where they learned how to sell liquor. And they all moved to Houston and they all opened liquor stores and grocery stores. And um, so that's the milieu that my dad grew up in. And um, as, you know, as we came up, we were, we were still being introduced to distant cousins when we were well into grade school, up until the time we were 12 or 13 years old still oh, meet awesome. meeting family for the first time. Yeah. So, and we all, you know, there's family reunions. We, everyone does make an effort still to stay in touch and to keep their children in touch with distant cousins. It's yes. It's my family's like that too. Yeah. It is important. And it was the same kind of thing. Like my family's from New York. I know nobody ever believes I'm from Houston. I mean, I did grow up in New York until I was 10. That's why I sound like this, but I mean, I lived most of my life in Texas. I should not sound like this, Wow. but yeah, we had a big, big family and that we would all get together all the time. And it was like hellacious. It was, it was crazy, but it was so fun. And I, you know, I have a good billion cousins. My grandfather was one of like eight or nine children. Yeah. Same thing came through Ellis Island. And I mean, I have a million cousins. And so my husband always jokes that I'm pulling cousins out of my ass. Cause he's like, we've been <laughs> married for over 30 years. How am I just hearing of cousin so-and-so? Like we went to Florida and I posted something on Facebook and my cousins were like, oh, we're right down the road. Let's, we'll want to take you for dinner. And my husband's like, I've never heard of these people. I'm like, yeah, they were at so-and-so's bar mitzvah. Well, I don't know. I don't remember. We go to this restaurant. There's like 15 people there. He's like, what the heck? <laughs> <laughs> he's like, man, you really do have cousins out the yin yang. I mean, he's like, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. But it's so lovely. It's so nice to have like a 
big family where you, you know, do have that intergenerational experience. Um, well, what, and one thing I'm noticing now that I think is, is maybe in some ways uniquely American, I don't know, but I had um, breakfast this morning with a, a tribe of people that, that I've known since, uh, that I knew growing up. And they have all stayed in contact. Some of them are related by blood. Some of them know each other through the fact that their parents got divorced and they were a stepbrother or stepsister growing up. But this uh-huh. is this is chosen family and this is circumstan- yeah. circumstantial family. And it's 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 amazing to me that they have formed and kept these bonds and that now later in life this this is their lifeline. They are each other's lifeline. Is there like a life concept that you wish you had adopted sooner or understood sooner? Some of the best advice, I guess if you could call it advice, it wasn't really advice, but it was a it was a a saying that has stayed with me for many years. And it was um, a friend of my mom's who she shared it. She said that her father had told this to her. He said, you know, you can't teach people, you can't tell people what to do, but you can leave them alone until they learn how to act. And this Mm. was, you know, an old farmer guy or an old, just an old Texan or, you know, somebody who was just a a country person, but it was really wise. And I think for me, um, I wish that earlier in life I had learned to be able to um, spot the infiltrators, the people that, that aren't wishing you well, the people that might be a little bit more opportunistic. Um, I wish that I'd been able to have a better filter for those people throughout life, because I think I could have saved myself some trouble. But on the other hand, on the other hand, you, you really do learn from those experiences and you, you know, it's not, it's not squandered. So, yeah. You know what? You're, I know it's true. Like, I'm, as I was asking the question, I'm like, well, you can't really know until you have those experiences. You know, it's hard to get, it's hard to get those concepts until you've really had those experiences. So I guess, you know, you have to have them. You can't kind of skip over that part, but sometimes you, it takes you a couple tries to get that concept. You're like, I, yeah, you know what? I think, uh, I think it was Maya Angelou who said people, when people show you who they are, believe them. Yes. And that's that concept that you just talked about. So yeah, yes. that is a good piece of advice. Well, yeah. what, what, um, what's your favorite, do you have like a favorite health or beauty product? <sighs> yes, I do. I have a Ooh, couple. What do you oh, I know. I have a couple right now. I have a, um, I have two things. Well, I have this, this facial scrub that I'm using. It's made by, I think it's Dauphin. I'm not sure how you pronounce it's French, but it's D-A-U-P-H-I-N, I think is how it's spelled. And it is a moisturizing scrub that you, it's like a three minute spa trip that you put on in the shower and you can leave Ooh. it on your, while you're, you know, washing your hair or whatever. Um, so that's one of my favorite products. Um, I guess that's my that number good. one right now. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's so funny because like I ask the men too when I interview them and they, nobody's had, no guy has ever had a product. They're like, oh, you got a soap and a towel. And John Mackey, I mean, he didn't have anything. He said he has sunblock. I asked him if he at least used sunblock. I mean, no, none of the guys, but you ask a woman and they're like, oh yes, I have something to share. <laughs> it's, it's kind of maddening. Um, you, but, know, you know, I, yeah. I'm glad you 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 said John Mackey's name because I have a John Mackey story. Oh, tell uh, me. Yeah, I've never um, met him before. Um, oh, he's so lovely. I, I, I yeah, I would love to meet him. I actually um, found a book on our bookshelves at, at random. It was a paperback book, and it had been given to my husband by John Mackey, and it was a a, a book called Eat to Live by a a doctor oh, called, yeah. called Joel Furman, MD. I'm interviewing him next week. You are? Joel Furman. Uh-huh. Oh. Yeah, I have Eat to Live in My Living Room right now. I'm reading it right oh, now. Oh my gosh. I have to tell I you mean, that. I mean, rereading yeah. it. That it's book, so good. Yeah. That book changed my life. That was the book <gasps> that 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 I used to overhaul my diet in my 50s. And it, it, made, me, it made me 50% healthier 
than I was before. So I, I want his autograph, by the way. I'm, I'm like a oh my god, I'm like a fan girl of Joel of Furman, John so. Mackey or Joel Furman. Joel Furman, yeah. <laughs> oh, he's so nice. He's hilarious. I mean, he's very. Um, I, I like him because, you know, he just tells it how it is. And I've, I've met him a couple of times and, uh, you know, like over Zoom and everything, not in person, but he's great. And I'm interviewing him next week. And he, so do you do, do you eat a salad every day? I know that's a big thing for him is eat a salad, at least one of your meals. Yes, I do. And I also teach that in my cooking classes. I tell everybody, if you have one takeaway from this class, eat a big freaking salad every day if you can uh-huh. especially yes. younger people especially younger people because they're just looking for the hack they want the right. one life hack that's what everything is now give me one give me one easy give hack, hack. <laughs> so yeah but i do yeah i love that i do too Aww. makes a big it's just, it's okay just, well i'll tell him he has a fan next okay, week yeah. when i interview him um <laughs> well let, let me just ask one more question do you have like um a public person that you admire their approach for aging Oh, so many. Um, I'm going to say you know, off the top of my head, there's a, um, there's a celebrity couple that I get a huge kick out of. It's Kevin Bacon and his wife, uh, Kira Sedgwick. Kira Sedgwick. I love yeah, them. They, they are always at their farm playing their instruments and, and just having a blast together, just doing dumb stuff. And I, I think that the two of them are, uh, it's very endearing to see, you know. <laughs> I love that. Yes, that's seems, a, yeah. such a good answer. Yes, I <laughs> love them. Really I funny. love when he's playing his guitar for the animals, and this is so fun. Um, yeah. Well, I usually so I ask. I think was that your best piece of advice that you ever received was from the farmer man? Because I usually ask that too. That was definitely one of them. You I do you have one more or? Yeah, let me think of of uh, let me. If I think of it, we can come back to it. But that, I think that was, that is that the is standout. A- it's a standout because it does two things. It gives you permission to step away from someone. And it reminds you that um, there is another way through these things other than continuing to butt heads with someone. Yeah, You can just throw the rope. And you can give, you can confer the authority on yourself to take as much space from them as you need. And mm. uh, for me, that was a useful boundary to learn. Um, I think and the, that's the smart the conferring the authority on yourself. That's another phrase that I started to use um, in my fifties. Like, you know what? I don't need anyone else's endorsement or permission. I am the authority on this and this is what I'm going to do. And mm. what a what an empowering gift to myself. And yeah. it was hard one. It wasn't like oh, I'm taking charge here. It was I have got to take leadership. Somebody has got to and it's going to be me. Yeah. Oh, that's such good advice, Trish. I love that. I think you you get a gold star. So um, is there anything, is there anything else you want to share with us? I mean, you've been very insightful already. I, I think we covered some good bases. I think, really. I think we it's covered it. Great conversation. We'll have Aww. to, we'll have to talk again sometime. We'll have to do a check-in yes. and see how things are as, as time goes on, as the world turns. Well, thank you so much for being here and I will see you at yoga, you darling person. Thanks for listening, friend. From my heart to yours, be well until we meet again.